I'm now joined with Christine Brennan, a sports journalist and author. Christine, we're at the 2010's uh, CME conference. How special is it to ha be around all these sports executives today and have a day like this? You know, Jake, I really enjoy coming here. Matt Winkler's a dear friend, and I've, I've done this for many years in different venues. He moves it around. Now we're, now we're of course, at Nationals Park, and I, I expect we'll fully, fully expect we'll be at the White House in a couple years, the way Matt uh, gets, his, gets his way in, into the Washington fabric and culture. Um, but seriously, I, I think it's a great event. Um, it's, I, I get energy from the students and from the young people who are here. I learn from them. I mean, I, I love to be on the panels and talk to everybody, but there's such a, such a vibrancy and energy here, and, and I think there's a lot of answers, too. You know, a lot, of, a lot of the young folks here have the answer for monetizing the Internet. They have the answer. These are the people that are going to be making a lot of the decisions uh, as our world continues to evolve and change with the communications world and sports and marketing. So it's fascinating. I, I, I saw the uh, the all the speakers on your panel and and you talked a lot about social media and it's it's really becoming one of these things that's sort of taking over sports and entertainment and it's always in the media and news. How has social media changed sports? Oh, it's a, it's well, it's incredible the change and it's changing it in in leaps and bounds. Certainly, athletes having their own websites, athletes tweeting, athletes on Facebook. That's that's one part of it, as we know, where they're getting the word out. They don't need the middleman. You know, I guess you could say that I and, and, the, and the traditional media were kind of the middleman. And all of a sudden now, you know, they don't use us. So Tiger Woods puts stuff on his website, or Shaq tweets, or Dara Torres tweets. And, and I'll tell you, going into the Olympic Games in Vancouver, I was following a lot of athletes on Twitter for, not so much because I cared about what movie they saw on the plane or, or whether they were brushing their teeth, but about injuries, what they think of their opponents, any of the back and forth, you know, as, as we worked our way towards the Olympic Games. So I can learn a lot from that as well. And then for me, I mean, I come from the dinosaur, you know, from, from the print side, and I have a Twitter account. And I love tweeting. I use it as little, I kind of call it little journalism. I've got a Facebook account. I use that. Of course, I blog. Uh, we did a Today sh uh, 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 Vancouver Today from uh, uh, the Olympics for USA Today. So we had a newspaper <laughs> doing television. Um, so I am all about this and embracing it as much as I can. Yeah, now you mentioned Tiger Woods, especially with Twitter, but obviously uh, you've been one of the big, uh, you know, people on, on, on Tiger Woods and it's become this whole, you know, whole uh, completely crazy thing in the media. D does Tiger Woods, is he responsible? Does he have an obligation to apologize to the public because he's a public figure? Or does he have, you know, do you think that he has some element of privacy just that people should leave him alone a little bit? You know, he could have done it any way he wanted to. I mean, I, um, you know, obviously the news happened uh, the day after Thanksgiving. Things started to unravel for him. The tabloid side of this story is something I have I've not covered. Uh, I've written what, one, two, three, four, five, I guess five columns on this in the last you know, four, five months. I've certainly written more columns on figure skating than I have on Tiger Woods. So it's a huge story, don't get me wrong. But I, I think, you know, a lot of us are being, are, are, are reporting on it or writing or, or giving our opinion. And there's a lot we don't know yet. And I think Tiger clearly thought he had to apologize because he had his February 19th speech where he did that. Uh, my questions and my take on it has been much more about what do we believe and what don't we believe and change. You know, if, if, if there's change, if he's a changed man, and again, he has a right to do whatever the heck he wants. He sure doesn't have to listen to me. I don't expect that he ever would. But in terms of he has the same caddy, the same agent, he's got that same kind of control freak. You know, five minutes, you get a chance to you know, talk to me for five minutes. Two people get to talk to me. Five minutes, done. Um, you know, on February 19th, when he had a speech, Jake, he uh, stick it to Accenture. You know, the Accenture exactly. tournament's going on at the exact same time. Ernie Els said this. I didn't have to say it. You know, he said that was selfish. You can print that. Right. Uh, I'm at the Olympics, but here, you know, this he kind of crash lands into the Olympics, crash lands into the Accenture tournament. Uh, you know, I think the question is, has Tiger really changed? Now, that's, and some might say, hey, that's up to his wife uh -huh. and his family. And I hope for his kids and his wife that, and for Tiger that things work out for them. But that's the side I don't know about. What I know about is the fall from grace yeah. of a cultural icon, something like, the likes of which we've never seen before. And from that standpoint, that's how I feel I've been covering it. Okay. Well, yeah, it's definitely really amazing uh, how it just keeps progressing. It's a continuing soap opera, really. Um, I, I want to switch gears. Uh, I was curious to get, you know, we're at the CME conference, and it, it's a it's a, a place where all these sports executives come, and I wanted to get the women's perspective about, about as a woman 
you know, this industry is so dominated by men, at least historically. I know women are continuing to get into it. And what's, what's maybe some advice you'd give to women out there who are looking to get into the industry? Maybe even people in, my, in uh, the sports management program here at Georgetown. Sure. I mean, it could be maybe intimidating for people just because it's so many men. What do you do to get noticed? You know, all of these issues. Sure. Well, I think uh, women have a great opportunity still in sports. And as we're, as we're encouraging uh, every daughter as well as our sons to play sports at a young age, Title IX is working its magic. Girls know more about sports than ever before. They're playing sports as ever before. It makes perfect sense that when they grow up, when they go to college and grow up, that they would want to be in the sports world. Um, that is a natural thing, whether they want to coach or be in sports management or the media, communications, whatever it might be, I think it's a fascinating world. And my advice to women would be basically the same as men, which is work harder than everybody else out there. Uh, if you have to pull an all-nighter, pull the all-nighter. Uh, get good grades. Um, really work on internships for the summer when you're in college so that you have practical experience. And if you're not sure if you want to be in the media and or maybe on the uh, the side of or, you know of administration in sports or with a team or with a with an agent uh, group or whatever that is, try out those things. Try to get as many opportunities as you can either through school programs or through internships so that you can then have a a, a, a wide range of knowledge about this wonderful world of sports, and then start to maybe pick and choose. Having said that, you know, the economy is, is dreadful. Let's just be honest. I don't have to tell anyone who's listening to us. It's really difficult to get jobs everywhere. Right. So, so I even would say, you know, take a deep breath. Tell your parents it might be a year or two. <laughs> Not happy news for a lot of people, especially after you've graduated. Um, but continue to plug away on internships. And even after you've graduated, this is a little thing, but even after you've graduated from college, so you're, you've already you're finished your senior year, you're done. Internships are still a viable option. I run into so many people, whether it's the com communication media side or, or the business side of sports, who think that they cannot have a summer internship or a fall internship after they've graduated, that they've got to get a full-time job. Internships are the key to getting your foot in the door. Even after you've graduated, don't be afraid to take an internship and just try to stick around as long as possible within the confines of the place you're working. So anything you can do to get practical experience, because if you've got practical experience, even with great grades, even with an excellent academic environment, if you've got that practical experience, you will have a better shot of getting hired uh, and and that's what it's all about, obviously. And this ain't no dress rehearsal, yeah. as as, <laughs> as, as, you said as my as my late dad used to say. This ain't no dress rehearsal, meaning go for it. If you love something, hey, I got to tell you, you know, growing up in the '60s and '70s, as I said, you know, a girl playing sports that was the weirdest thing in the whole neighborhood. Uh, I'm sure people were saying, "What is going on at the Brennan household with you know this girl playing sports?" And it wasn't all the brothers; it was my dad and me throwing the baseball, going to games. My other siblings came along. And it was just following my heart, following my passion. Not listen, don't listen to naysayers. Don't listen to people who say you can't do something. Put blinders on and full steam ahead. I'd say that for young men or young women, but I think women, you're right. To give a special nudge and to say, if you love sports as a girl, playing sports in high school, college, uh, as an athlete, you will love sports even more as a career. I, I, I'm living proof of that. That's terrific advice. And uh, Christine Brennan from Toledo, Ohio. I'm from Detroit, so I know we have that the uh, the Michigan connection. I went to the University of Michigan undergrad, so I know, you know, I grew up, well, I'll, that I'll school down it. south. We uh, no that Ohio State thing. No, no, no. Toledo might as well be Toledo, comma Michigan. We're right on the border. Everyone can get out their map. Look at Toledo. It's basically in Michigan. And so we did go. We drove those 45 minutes to Ann Arbor every Saturday when Michigan was at home for years. Go blue, even though it's been a tough few years. Well, you, have, hang in there. you have no idea how much that means to me to hear, <laughs> to hear that. So I appreciate this interview, and, and thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks very much. Yeah. Take care.